what I'm showing here is open API uh, rendered spec of the Dark Shield API. So this is a fairly useful URL that can be hosted where you can see all the different endpoints that the API provides. And then under each endpoint, the sort of expected schema that it expects to get, right? You can see how the JSON payloads will look, you know, what are required parameters, what are not. And as well as you can see a couple of different examples of how JSON payloads will look for if you wanted to hash emails, for example. This is one example that you can run straight out of this interface and execute directly through curl and you'll see what sort of command gets sent um, and then what sort of response you get so this is a very useful tool for the implementer so whoever needs to call this api can reference this documentation to figure out how to do what they need to do so what sort of search criteria they want to define what sort of masking functions they want to use things of that nature so at the beginning here, I'm just going to showcase the API just to show you the different search and masking techniques that Dark Shield supports. And then for the second part okay. of the demo, I'll be showing the actual Mongo connectivity and how we would mask, search and mask a Mongo collection through the Dark Shield API. To begin, the first thing that you would have to do if you're interested in using Dark Shield is to define a search context. A search context is, in essence, an, an endpoint that allows you to define how you want to find the PII that you're looking for, right? So it depends on what sort of PII that you're interested in finding. So as an example here, one of the first examples is uh, as an email matcher, right? And an email matcher is, in essence, just a regular expression pattern that will match on any email that is the regular form. You know, it has an at sign, it has a .com or a .org, so it's very easily captured by this regular expression here. Dark Shield supports a variety of different matcher types for the search matchers. So the one that you just saw was a regular expression. We also support named entity recognition, which allows you to find named entities, things like people's names, addresses, dates using a natural language processing model that was trained on data where person names were found, as an example. Using the context of the sentences that it finds, it's able to identify names or named entities. So as an example, if I had a sentence, I went out for lunch with John, this model would be able to pick up that John, in the context of that particular sentence, is a named entity of the type person, right? So. This is a very useful for finding things in unstructured data, for finding named entities in unstructured data, where you don't have a list of all the possible uh, variations of what you're trying to find, right? So you don't have all the possible addresses or all the possible names that could exist within your data, but you can use the context of the sentence in which that data appears in to make the match. We also support using dictionary lookups. You can provide a dictionary set file, lists all the different variety of text or PII that you want to find. So useful maybe in a GTPR, a right to be forgotten context where you can specify all the information that you know about a person and uh, Dark Shield would be able to search and mask that information throughout your collection. We also provide a fuzzy alternative to that, a fuzzy matching, where it takes the same dictionary lookup, but it also matches on misspellings, right? So you might misspell a certain name in your data or misspell a certain address. And depending on the parameters of the fuzzy search, you might be able to identify those particular uh, misspellings and mask them as well. I'll go ahead and I'm going to create this context here it's gonna have one email matcher or actually I'll, I'll do a mixture it doesn't have to be just one matcher right you can have an email matcher that's also combined with a name matcher right one that finds emails and another one that does named entity recognition on a person name we can connect to this particular site and download that model i think it was down today so hopefully it doesn't return any errors saying that this uh, this URL is down, but it's going to take a while for it to load. But yeah, it managed to load here. So now if I wanted to use that context 
to search through data, I would use this endpoint here, the dot search endpoint. And I'll select an example that corresponds with the uh, the mixed matcher that I was using. And here you can see that we have uh, some text which contains both a name and an email address. So if I execute this using the search context I previously defined, it would return a list of annotations for me, right? So it annotates that particular text. So you can see that it found John Doe. Uh, you see what matcher found it. Uh, you see the type of the match, you see where it starts and ends. And since the type of the match is uh, named entity recognition, it also has an additional field called probability, which defines how probable the model thinks the match is, right? This is some extra information specific to named entity recognition models. Same thing for the pattern search, right? You, you see that the email matcher matched on this email address and, and these character offsets, and the type of the match was a pattern match. So if we wanted to then take our annotations and mask them, we can use the mask endpoints that are available on top here. Before we do that, we have to define a mask context. So this is the analog to the search context that we defined for our search method previously. Now, a mask context contains several things. The first is a list of rules that we want to apply. So in this case, we have two rules. One is our format preserver and encryption rule that we're going to be using for names. Um, and this is basically an AES-256 encryption uh, function. Retains the length of the original text, retains capitalizations, dashes, non-character. It masks characters, right? Characters with other characters and digits with other digits. So this is a very useful algorithm that we recommend to use for things like names or social security numbers. All you would have to do is pass in a passphrase and you can use that same passphrase to decrypt that data if you needed to see what the original was as an example. The second rule here is a hashing rule. So it's just a regular hashing function just to demonstrate some of the different capabilities we have around rules. Both of these expressions are written out in our standard co-sort language, sort CL language, which is what is the engine that we use for masking in both our field shield and dark shield products. So all of these expressions are available in our manual, so you don't have to uh, worry about how these are defined. And the last part here is our rule matchers. A rule matcher basically defines how an annotation is associated with a masking rule. So for example, this FPE name rule matcher um, associates any match that was created by a name matcher and assigns the format reserve and encryption rule to it, right? Similar thing for this rule matcher here, which assigns any annotation that was annotated by an email matcher with the hashing rule. So this is a useful way for us to define different masking rules for different types of annotations that are present in your annotated text. So you can hash emails and encrypt names all in one single request. We also support things like pseudonymization for, for things like names, if you wanted to replace a realistic name with another realistic name as an example. So now, that we've defined a mask context, we can send requests to that mask context to perform masking. So again, I'll select the example that we had previously, right? John Doe, you know, John Doe at gmail.com, this entire text. We're also going to pass in the list of annotations that we got from our search results previously. That's what it will use to def decide which portions of the text to mask, right? So if I really quickly execute this endpoint with this example. You will see our name was format preserved and encrypted, right? So it was John Doe before, now it's uh, was EGK. The capitalizations were retained, the length was retained. And then the email address was just given a, a hash, right? So that's okay. what this long uh, string is here. 
on top of that, you get to see, again, the result of your masking. So you get to see the annotation that was masked, the actual result of the masking, and the rule that was applied. So again, for uh, compliance purposes, you know exactly what rule was applied to do the masking here. Same thing for this annotation. We, we get the mask result. We get the offset of the masked result in this case. So that if, for example, we failed to mask some portions of the text, we can change some parameter and then resend this request to only mask the part of the text that we did not yet mask. So it's a very useful tool for redoing additional masking operations. Uh, you can also store this in case you wanted to uh, unmask what you mask. You have the exact offsets of where the mask results were in the text. So you can take this. Was EDK, you know exactly in the text where it appears, and then you can have create a decryption rule to decrypt this name in the original text. Just as an example, again. And then finally, just to finish this portion of the demo off, we can do the exact same process in one step. So instead of doing the search first and then the mask. Afterwards, we can send a single request that performs the search for us and the masking at the same time. And we just specify the, the context that we are using, right? The names of those contexts that we defined previously. And if I execute this, you get the same results back, right? So you get the mask text, the annotation, the mask result, what rule was applied, right? So the same exact information. The certain functions you can reverse or decrypt them. So the encryption function that we use is a format preserved encryption AES-256. So as long as you use the same passphrase that was used in the encryption, you can decrypt that information if you so chose. The hashing was a one-way uh, hash, right? So you can hash the data, but you can't get the original back. So it's, there are different functions for different use cases that you can define, depending on whether you want it, the operation to be reversible or not. Format preserved encryption preserves referential integrity because John Doe that was masked in one portion of the collection, the ciphertext produced for that would be the exact same one as the ciphertext produced in another part of the collection. So you would have that association between the two. So you might not know what the original name was, but you know that the name in this part of the collection is the same as the name in another part and refers to the same person as an example. All of this is controlled by the different functions, masking functions that we use. The second portion of the API is for file-based search and masking. Before we were just doing just plain text, but we also support different file types, things like PDFs, Word documents, JSON. And this is the API that I'm going to use to demonstrate our Mongo capability. We do CSV, we do XML. We will be supporting Microsoft documents as well. That's already supported in our GUI front end. We're currently in the process of transferring it over to the API. So we also support different image formats like PNG, JPEG some other image formats using optical character recognition so we can parse out the text and mask it in images. Images that are also embedded in PDF documents or Word documents as well. I'm not going to go over the endpoints here. What I will do instead is I'm going to show you the code that I wrote to interface to this API, which is going to serve as our connection between Mongo and this API so we can send requests to the same API. So what I have here is written in Python. As I said at the beginning, you can write the same exact form of code in uh, JavaScript. Presumably your client already has ways of accessing your, the Mongo databases in JavaScript, so they would be familiar with the process that they would need to undergo. This first script here just defines our setup for our backend, our Dart Shield backend. So again, we define the different search matchers that we're going to use, right? We're, we're interested in, in, in an email matcher, say an, a phone matcher, names matchers, right? Using named entity recognition models, as I've shown previously. 
We also define the masking rules that we're gonna use. Again, it's gonna be format preserving encryption and hashing. So in this case, we're going to encrypt, format preserve and encrypt both phone and name matchers. So both of them will have the same rule applied to them. And then a hashing rule will be applied to the emails that we have. One interesting caveat to the file searches is that we can also define content filters. So in this case, we're going to be handling JSON data. So we can define a JSON path content filter, which allows us to filter on certain keys. In this case, anything, any JSON key that contains the word name in it. And this is useful because if we look at our uh, demo uh, data, right, we have uh, different locations where we can see names. For example, the name of the person in this document, uh, as one example. We also have a list of friends with, with their names in here as well. So we want to be able to mask those names. We don't necessarily need to search for those names, right? We know that they are located in in any JSON key that as, long, as soon as you see name, as soon as Dark Shield sees name, it can just mask Cassie Wynn here or uh, Thomas Duffy. For name identity recognition, we're going to search through this, these sentences here, so that we can identify the name that was in this sentence right here, right? So that's where the name identity recognition model is going to come in handy. And again, we just have an email address and a phone number. And these are fairly easily matched using our regular expression, regular expression matchers. So we don't have to define any additional filters for them. If I go ahead and run this setup, I'm going to execute it and send those requests through the API. So now those contacts that I mentioned are hosted. For the crux of the demo, here's where I define how we are going to connect to the database, right? our Mongo database. Before I do that, I'm just going to show you what is inside of the database. You can see that we have one collection called data. If I do a find here, you can see exactly what is inside of this collection. It is just import of this JSON file that I was showing previously. And there are no other collections in that database. But we're going to create another collection called mask, which is going to collect contain our mask data. And what we'll do is we're going to iterate over the cursor, the Mongo cursor, to find the documents inside. And we're going to send those documents to the API. And what we'll get back out of it is we'll get the results, right? The results of the masking, the search in the masking, which we'll output into the file system here. And we'll also get the actual output, the JSON output, which we're going to send back to the Mongo database and store it. So if I run this, You'll, you'll see exactly what gets executed. So you can see this results one JSON file here. This is where the results search and masking is. So you can see this is fairly similar to what I was showing previously. The difference here is that we have additional keys defined because we are searching through a document, this time of the type JSON. And it defines some additional keys for the exact location of where our information was found. So for example, in this case, we found something inside of the name key, right? And we look at the annotations that were found inside. We found Kathy Wynn. So dollar dot name corresponds to this name here, right? At the root level of, of the document. Similarly, we can look at email, phone, we see exactly what the match result was for each the rule that was applied. You, you can see also that we've matched our friends, right? The, our friends' names here. So friends zero, friends one, dot name, all of those correspond to the friends here. And then finally, we also found Kathy Wynn in this location using our named entity recognition model. And here we can see the mask result that was put out. And you can see that the name is exactly the same as, or the ciphertext is exactly the same as the one that we put out for our mask result for Cassie Wynn in, in the other uh, location that we found it in. So that again is where we preserve referential intent. If I just show you the collections that are available in the Mongo database now, you can see that there's a masked collection. 
And if, if I just do a dump here, you can see exactly where the mask information is, right? You can, you can see uh, this was masked, our email was hashed. I'll actually go ahead and just copy this over into a JSON file. So I'll just say a result.json. So it's easier to see how it looks, right? So yeah, the name was uh, format preserved and encrypted. The email address was hashed. The phone number was also format preserved and encrypted. I should be able to actually compare the two files in this interface so you can see what the difference is. This wasn't formatted properly, so we won't be able to see it as well. In essence, it matched information both in these atomic values and inside of this unstructured text right here, where it only masks Cassie Wynn in this particular location. There are two approaches we can recommend. One is if you have like a timestamp, right, in the document that defines when the document was added, you can basically just uh, select, do a selection here where the filter is on a certain timestamp, right, on the document, and it'll only search and mask those documents that were that were recently added, as an example. So this would, again, be defined through this either JavaScript or Python file here. The other approach that we can also recommend is whatever is added into this database, into this Mongo collection, before it is added, it can, that data can go through the Dark Shield API for masking purposes first. And then once it's masked, it's inserted into the collection. So that's more efficient because you don't have to do queries, repeated queries or schedule queries on the original collection. You can just mask the data as it's coming in. And you're also guaranteed that there is no point in time when that database collection contains unmasked data, right? So it's always masked because it's masked as soon as it enters the collection. It depends on if you're using the GUI or the API. The API can have access to any data source by virtue of this setup code here. So, you know, in, in under 40 lines of code, I, I basically have a connection to a Mongo database. It's, it's going to be about the same amount for, for a Cassandra database, or maybe if you were using JDBC connectors to connect to a relational database. It's just slightly different code over here. Again, most of the work uh, that needs to be done is in the Dark Shield API, which processes the text or the documents that you send it and sends back the results. And then where those results go is again up to, up to the client here. So in our case, uh, I put out the results in the file system and sent the output of the mask into, back to the Mongo database, but it could have just as easily gone to somewhere else. It could have replaced the existing collection, different sources and different targets. All of this would be defined in, in this code here. The Dark Shield API is, just defines how search and masking occurs on text or files, right, and the different file types. The, the Dark Shield API doesn't know anything about Cassandra, doesn't know anything about Mongo or any other database. It just knows how to search and mask files. So as long as you have codes that can send those files to the API, it doesn't matter what source it was. It doesn't matter where the target of the results are. That's why we built it. We built it for this flexibility in mind so that the users can uh, use it in different processes you know, and they can define how those processes operate to great detail in essence. So they can fine tune it to their needs and requirements.